what's up everyone and welcome to Found Flicks. On this thing explain, we're looking at Satan's Slaves, which comes to us from Indonesian horror maestro Joko Anwar. Satan's Slaves is another triumph brimming with well-constructed scares. He's especially good with timing, but it also spends a lot of time developing the family at the center of the story, which, you know, helps you give a crap when the spooky stuff starts. Slaves also has a surprisingly large story that increases in scale until it reaches a breakneck massive conclusion. So let's check out Satan's Slaves, breaking down the story what we learn about the cult that is terrorizing the family and explaining the ending that sets up for the story to continue in a sequel. We first see Matriarch Mawarni looking quite ill and chanting for the charms of the king and queen to come to them, send the children. A single tear rolls down her cheek as she continues to repeat the phrase in bed. We learn that due to Mawarni's illness, the family has fallen on incredibly difficult financial times. She was a once popular singer and her daughter Rini visits her record label in hopes of finding some money there, but the royalties have all dropped dried up. There is nothing that he can do to help. Rini treks back to her home well outside of the city, walking through a forest during a storm. At home, she's immediately overwhelmed by her younger siblings, Bondi, and the youngest, Ian, who is deaf. And we can tell that the family is quite strongly bonded. Her papa is busy fixing up things around the house, and she informs him there are no more royalties. She then chides him for mortgaging the house in the first place, but he argues that he didn't have a choice. They needed money for mama's treatments. Besides, it's technically her house anyway, and not even his to sell. A bell rings, and Bari gruffly orders her to tend to her mother. She confronts Bondi, didn't you hear the bell? But it's obvious the boy is terrified of her, wondering why Mama isn't still in the hospital. Well, because we ran out of money, and Rini stresses the importance of helping Mama. She is still family after all. Rini comes to her, still weakly ringing her precious bell. She checks her out to see if she is hungry or what the deal is. Mama smacks a bowl right off the nightstand, proceeding to scream, ringing the bell even harder and begins to convulse. She's staring deep deep into a corner in the room. Rini stares up, but can't see anything there. Suddenly, the tantrum stops and Mama passes out. Rini's still staring up into that mysterious corner. Later, Papa puts on one of his wife's records, which is a sappy ballad. He tells Grandma outside sewing on the porch that it's time to come inside. Then his oldest, Tony, comes home and has sold his bike to help with the family's financial struggles. While Papa isn't totally disconnected from the family, it's obvious that Rini more or less manages the entire clan. While cooking, Bondi is curious about something his teacher said at school. According to her, at a funeral after the last person leaves, walking 40 steps, it causes the dead person to wake up. Just for a bit, though. Rini, along with the family overall, aren't superstitious or believe in the paranormal. Rini joking, how would you even know that they came back? Would he put cameras in the casket? Tony joins his siblings, and as she didn't expect him to be home, she didn't make him any food. He's not bothered, he already ate earlier, and doesn't care for her cooking to boot. He pulls out a bag of beef, sharing it with his delighted brothers. She's curious where he got the money, and seeing that his wife watch is missing, she already knows. The bell tolls, and Tony and Rini discuss about if he's combed her hair yet. Tony! Mama weakly croaks, calling for him. He is kind, caring, and gentle with his ailing mama, combing her hair, and fantasizing about when she gets better, and they can play music together. A big chunk of hair then falls out to his shock. A window crashes open, and he turns back to mama looking wide-eyed. He brushes it off, promising to get her some hair cream in the morning. Later, Rini spots her dad talking to his wife, overhearing something about asking for pity for the children. She creaks the door open, and he grunts for her to go to bed. In the dead of night, everyone is asleep, and Mama starts ringing her bell. Rini rises from her bed, dreamily following the sound. She enters her mom's room, baffled to see her standing by the window in a white gown. How are you standing at all, she asks. Rini places a hand on her shoulder, yet the bell keeps ringing. She sees that Mama is still in bed, so then who the heck is that? She slowly turns back, and the entity stares back with a deranged, toothy grin, but looks just like her Mama. She wakes from the nightmare, yet things start playing out exactly like in her dream. She follows the same path and shockingly sees the woman at the window again. Marwani says nothing, staring blankly outside. She puts a hand on her shoulder again, but no one in bed this time. She looks back to her with her mouth agape, and she collapses to the floor like a sack of potatoes dead. The rest of the family rush to her side, and just like that, she is gone. They hold a funeral for her, wrapping her body in funeral sheets. Dad thanks the Ustad for all of his help, learning that he is new to the area. He notes that he hasn't seen their family at the local mosque, and Bari admits that they don't pray. His son, Hindra, warmly introduces himself to Rini, but she doesn't even give him the time of day. Bondi is still at the grave, paralyzed in fear. He's the last one at the funeral, and he's on his 39th step. Rini iterates that that isn't true, and what's your plan anyway? You're just gonna stand there forever? He stares intently for a few moments before he caves and leaves the gravesite. A bunch of the villagers all gather at the family's house to pray. Bari looks quite annoyed and doesn't pray along with the others. And I mean, they are chanting the exact same phrase over and over again. That would 
drive me nuts too, honestly. I know, all is cool. I get it, yeah. He puts his boys to bed, and Bondi wants to skip school as he is in mourning, he says. His dad tells him it's time to stop that. They've been doing that ever since Mama got sick in the first place. Now she's in a better place, so he doesn't have to be sad anymore. Now it's time to focus on school and working harder in order to help the family. Bondi agrees, but has another request. Can they at least switch rooms? Their window looks right out onto the graveyard. Bari tells him there's only dead people out there. They aren't gonna harm you. It's the living ones you need to worry about. Muggers, burglars, and the like. Bondi is clearly scared and signs the in asking if he is as well. His little bro rips on him and Bondi, frustrated, says he's not scared and rolls over to get some sleep. Oddly, Bari says out of nowhere that he has to lead the family to go make some cash. If they don't get some, soon the bank is going to foreclose on the house. They won't be able to contact him due to the phone line being cut and dad sighs they'll be fine without him, promising to be back as soon as possible. Bondi is unable to sleep and is drawn to the window. He does see someone out there and Ian gives him a startle. He's all, look outside, it's a zombie! But when seeing that they have a flashlight, they assume it's just the caretaker. Tony is listening to the radio in his room and just about to depart for Sleepy Town, Mama's bell ringing wakes him up. He presses up to her door, still hearing the bell's tone. He slowly opens the door to the darkness and the bell is there floating in the air. It quickly drops to the ground and Tony runs in terror back to his bed. It's another chaotic morning in the house with Rini trying to get all the boys ready for their days. Tony has a gift for the boys in the form of a viewmaster. Bondi excitedly yoinks it away, clicking through the slides. Ian wants to play with it too, and his bro tells him he's gotta wait. Count to 100 first. It's called Sharon. Ian, annoyed, picks a booger, rubbing it on him to his brother's disgust. Rini goes to fetch some water from the well, and when passing a mirror, it appears that there are two people in the reflection. She becomes unsettled and double checks, and with nothing there, assumes she just imagined it. Bondi plays with the viewmaster on his own, clicking through these shots of lovely vistas, until he gets to one that's just an old stone shack? The next one gets even closer to an open window. He clicks again, and Mama is there in her white dress smiling evilly. It scares Bondi, yet he returns to the slides, seeing a window with blue shutters and a park bench out in the woods. Ian is playing hide and seek out in the hall, flanked by a photo of Morani in an outfit that closely resembles that ghostly incarnation we've already seen. Grandma knocks furiously elsewhere. Ian runs his hand along the wall, feeling the vibrations. He flings open the door, and she happily rolls into his arms. Found you, Grandma! Ah, fun. Tony is back to listening to his radio in bed, and it tunes itself to another frequency, playing that same song of his mother's. He changes it back, and the radio keeps tuning itself to Mama's song. The bell rings, and he turns off the radio to listen harder. He turns it back on, hearing Moarney groaning for him through the radio. He quickly shuts it off and shoves it away. Moarney is now in his room, requesting for him to comb her hair. And Tony discovers her hairbrush on the ground. She begins to rise and spins around to face him. Tony flips the light on and she vanishes along with the brush. Sometime later, Ian wakes up and has to use the restroom, trying to get his brother to tag along, but he just falls back to sleep. He chooses the well room for his urinary needs. Soon, a POV shambles up from behind, but it's just his bro joining the PP party. When they go back into the house, Ian is stopped in his tracks by something. Bonnie doesn't understand what he's seeing, and Ian points down the hall. Bonnie grabs a sheet and they tiptoe down the corridor, the picture ominously overlooking them. He throws the sheet into the air and it drapes over an obviously invisible form. Rah! They yell, chasing after the boys. They shriek, drawing Rini to them, explaining they saw a ghost. Ian saw it too. He fibs that he didn't see anything, and Rini is convinced that they just imagined it. Tony isn't feeling as skeptical after his experiences and brings some of his mom's belongings to her grave, including the bell, hoping that this will allow her to find some peace. However, despite the entity resembling his mother, it's not actually her. And it's thanks to Hendra that we learn a bit more about what's going on here. He mentions seeing something unsettling at their mother's funeral, a very strange woman. That night, he returned to her grave, but found nothing there. And it must have been Hendra that the boy saw there that night. Unfortunately, his initial fears were confirmed a few days later. He happened to be walking by their house and saw that same lady staring down from the window. He clarifies that yes, it does look like her mom, but the entity was never human. Evil entities can not only possess people's bodies, but also imitate their physical appearance. And that's what's going on here. This evil entity is taking on Moarni's form to screw with the family. Hinder proposes they should move out of the house, offering for them to stay with him. Rini turns down the kindness, deciding to wait until their dad gets home. There is a brief moment of grandma struggling to get to her feet, and when Rini comes home, there's no sign of her. It's Bondi that finds her dead in the well, disturbing him to his core. The villagers gather for another funeral, with the story being told that she tripped and fell in the well. After what happened, Bondi is deeply traumatized with a low body temp and the shivers. Rini thinks that he must be in shock. Even she's in shock too. She puts grandma's wheelchair away and notices a letter 
letter that she was writing addressed to someone in Jakarta. Thinking it must be a clue, she enlists Hindra to give her ride into town. They track down the address to a scraggly man Budiman's place. They explain that their grandma wrote the letter and are hoping that he can help save them. He scolds them for opening other people's mail, but still invites him inside. Turns out he had quite a history with grandma, as they were friends all the way back to their schoolyard days. They were super close, but never dated. In fact, it was his best friend that she ended up marrying. They went on to have one son, Bari. There are some troubling aspects, as we learn, when Bari wanted to marry Mawarni, her parents refused to give their blessing, because back then, being an artist wasn't considered dignified. Not now necessarily either. It took a lot of time for her mama to bear a child, and there was a lot of friction between her and her grandma. Rini is confused. As far as she knew, her mom and grandma were always close. Yeah, but that wasn't until after she was born, he clarifies. Then when Mawarni got sick, grandma grew suspicious. She always believed that her mother didn't ask for children from Allah. Well, who else could you ask? Why, Satan, of course. Rini is still not believing all this kind of stuff. Isn't it all just made up? Well, her grandma certainly did believe. And if Rini doesn't, why would she be here in the first place? Budiman determines that something odd must have happened at their house. That's it, right? Back at the house, Bondi is still not looking well and mumbles, I don't want to, several times before completing the alarming phrase, kill my brother. Budiman hands over an occult magazine with an article that he wrote, hopeful that it might help them out. There's a worrying moment when the door bursts open and a dude appears with milky white eyes, but he's just here to give Budari massage. He inquires if he lost his shades again and the guy says that he did get a new pair, but people said they're ugly. Budiman quickly escorts the kids out. He's gotta have his massage. On the way out the door, he encourages the family to stick together no matter what. If they do that, the evil will not be able to get a hold of them. At home, Bodhi is still acting strange and refuses to eat with the rest of the family. Don't want to break that family connection like Budiman mentioned. And Rini forces him to sit at the table with everyone else. He is still looking more than a little nuts, hungrily eyeing his little bro. Rini stresses that they gotta stick together. No one else matters but the family from now on. Bondi continues acting odd and with obviously murderous intentions toward Ian. While asleep, he lifts an arm and begins signing, really looking like he's saying he's going to kill him. I don't know sign language, and even if I did, I wouldn't be able to translate Indonesian. But yeah, it sure looks like like that's what he's implying here. Ian attempts to ignore it, and Bondi appears, standing right over him, shrouded in darkness. He zombie walks back to his bed, leaving Ian covering his eyes in terror. He ventures out into the hall, following more thuds from the wall. He opens the doors to screaming and yowling, and a dark figure is there. He attempts to run, but gets his shirt caught on a hook, silently screaming for help. Long, bony fingers pry open the door, seeing a ghostly visage there before they slink away. Things take another turn when Rini puts on her mama's record, and it begins to distort. She knows notices that the label is peeling off and removes it, revealing more grooves hidden underneath. A regular playback only produces strange gibberish, but in classic satanic style, when played backwards, it is definitely some kind of chanting. She rushes to check on the boys, but Ian is missing. The shot tilts on his side as she frantically searches for the boy. She finds him in a crate outside, and he doesn't react at first, but he's just a heavy sleeper, I guess. She reminds him that they will always be here for him, the whole family, and gives him a big hug. Tony does read the magazine, and Rini is still just dismissing it all as nonsense, but Tony isn't skeptical at all anymore. Budiman's article details the uncovering of a fertility sect of Satan worshippers. There was a woman who was married for 10 years, but could not bear children. She finally had one, and Rena interjects with a scoff, oh, let me guess, thanks to Satan? Well, according to the article, many cities have serious cults worshipping Satan related to fertility. If someone wants a child and is barren, you can just join the church and get pregnant. Well, that makes the whole situation a lot more sinister, because it sure sounds like their mother joined one of those satanic cults in order order to have children of her own. Well, as good, right, Rini thinks, not so fast. As expected from the Lord of Lies, there are strings attached. The last child born must be given to the cult to be sacrificed when they turn seven years old. The point being, as long as you keep having children, technically you could avoid them getting taken. At least for a while, obviously. Rini is still convinced that all this is just a joke, but Tony is becoming a full-on believer. Back when their mom was singing, he would tag along to meetings and shows of hers. Every time there was this same group of people there, but but they never interacted with anybody else. He shows proof of this from an old photo book pointing out various people in the shots. Maybe they were schoolmates, Rini considers, but no, Tony even asked them who they were and they said nothing. So they must be members of the satanic cult their mother was also a member of and it is indeed quite real. And also as soon as this whole seven years old thing was mentioned, I'm like, 
Well, how old is Ian? Well, surprise, surprise, he turns seven in a scant three days. Just as Budiman mentioned, the child can only be taken if the family gives him up, and of course, they're not gonna do that. There is one part that he still can't believe, saying that the living dead will be the ones who actually come to collect the child. That's too much for Rini too. If it was something, you know, I don't know, more realistic, but the living dead, come on now. She tells him to stop reading that trash and gets to cooking. Ian waits patiently while she sets up the table. Out of nowhere, Grandma's wheelchair rolls itself right in, stopping behind her. Rini sees her in the glasses reflection, but not in reality, her first glimpse of something completely unexplainable. They enlist the Ustad to check things out in the house. He checks her room and their mother's, but says that the dead don't really bother the living usually. It's actually other beings taking the form of a loved one to tear the family apart, just as his boy said earlier. Rini is curious if they are safe now, and he admits that all he can do is ask Allah for help so nothing will disturb them. There is the issue of the family's own faith. Do they pray? We know they don't, but Rini says they do know how, implying that they were religious at some point, but turn their backs on it. He really thinks that they need all his help on this one, and you gotta pray wholeheartedly, or otherwise the evil can seep right through those cracks. Rini cleans herself up in the well water, and catches a watery glimpse of the ghoul there. She wipes away the water, and she's gone. She's now convinced to at least give the prayer thing a real try, and begins to do so. Meanwhile, in the boys' room, the door opens on its own, and Ian runs to slam it back. Rini concentrates deeply, spotting the white lady lingering in the window. Ian peeks out from his bed seeing what looks like his grandma there. She howls at him and he hides back under the blankets. The white lady now appears in the room with Rini over her shoulder. She can feel someone watching, cautiously looking behind her. She keeps trying to focus and the lady is back. She flings up the fabric, covering Rini as it grows larger and larger inside, trapping her within its mass of cloth. She's freaking out as long clawed hands crawl towards her. The lady lifts up her head and gives her a crooked smile. This incident sends him over to the to take up their offer of staying over. They know for sure that that isn't really Mama, a jinn, they suggest. Well, there are other beings besides them, and they have all been around long before since religion even existed. As for what they want from humans, well, to harvest their souls that they planted, of course. Unfortunately, according to the article, there is no way to actually defeat them, but you can disobey their rules. Again, if they are able to stick together, they won't be able to take Ian. Although there's another disturbing detail. The women in the cult don't actually get pregnant by their husbands, but by other men in the cult. This strikes a chord with Tony. He couldn't help but wonder why the four of them look so different from each other. Rini counters that many siblings do, but not to the extent of them, he notes. Kind of alarming, actually. If that is true, then Dad must have known something about the whole cult thing, I'd wager. How would all that be going on? And then you're like, wait, that doesn't look like me when your kid's born. There's a call from Budiman. He must have found something. And Hendra is more than happy to go on his own, smiling, he'll come home right after. He's dead. The Usad wants to hold a mass prayer at the house, inviting the whole ass village to put their prayer powers together. He tells them that houses in which the residents don't pray makes them more easily occupied by Satan. And it's really hard to get rid of that guy, trust me. Now word from this week's sponsor, Hello Fresh, America's number one meal kit. They're here with an answer to an age old question, what's for dinner? With their meal kits, it takes all the trouble out of figuring out what to eat. And with their huge variety with over 45 recipes to choose from each week, you'll never be bored. I love HelloFresh for a number of reasons, starting with the fact that they ship right to your door. Each box contains pre-portioned fresh ingredients, so there's less hassle and no wasted food. Cooking couldn't be easier, too, thanks to their included recipe cards with step-by-step -step instructions and pictures. That way, you'll be enjoying delicious home-cooked meals in no time. Maybe you need something even faster. And luckily, HelloFresh has a lineup of quick and easy meals, including meals that can be made in 15 minutes. Everybody's got time for that. We've all heard that breakfast is the most important meal the day, and HelloFresh agrees. That's why they're giving all subscribers free breakfast for life. As a special offer to our viewers, go to HelloFresh.com slash ending free and use code ending free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash ending free with code ending free. Hendra makes it to Budiman's and he acts a bit standoffish without Rini there. He's adamant that he's here to help the family and Budiman hands over his newest as of yet yet unpublished article. He won't elaborate on exactly what's within until he is pressed. Budiman puts on a cassette to drown out their conversation, and we are unable to hear what exactly he does tell the kid. Hendra takes off, and Budiman soon has another visitor. They shout that it's just the massage dude, and he grumbles back to come back later. Clearly suspicious, they start pounding aggressively on the door and tugging on it, and he arms himself with a large blade. Colt's on his ass. On the drive home, a random person runs out into the street, causing Hendra to swerve right into a truck 
which brutally runs him over, absolutely splattering his body. Dang, that satanic cult is sure becoming a lot more involved as things progress here. Clearly, they can't have them spilling all their secrets. His body is found and brought back to the Astad's house, him devastated at the sight of his mangled boy. They carry him inside, and that news article happens to drop on the ground. Luckily, Reedy notices it and pockets it, running after the others. Then it's time for a funeral number three in what feels like as many days. They continue staying with the Ustad, but things have turned sour, and he must blame them in some way for his son's death, giving him an extra cold shoulder when he comes in. Later that night, Rini is passed out at the table, and shadows start dancing along the wall. A loud clatter jolts her awake. She opens the window, briefly seeing a ghoul version of Hindra. They vanish, and something grabs hold tight on her arm. She shouts for the others, and they all work together to try to pull her back in. The Ustad watches from his room, but chooses to not intervene. On first glance, this might look like a dickish move, but it actually kind of makes sense as the family have to depend on each other in order to survive this ordeal. They're then surprised by someone else at the back door, but it's just Papa finally home from his mysterious trip, telling him it is time to come home. The kids fill him in on all the madness that has happened in his absence, leaving Papa a blubbering mess. He pulls himself together, and the plan is to pack things up tomorrow and move to a flat downtown. Rini finds Bari in Mama's room, and he apologizes for leaving them alone. She believes that he has more to apologize for, bringing up that conversation they had the night that that mom died. He defends that all he did was wish her well, but also believed that his children shouldn't have to suffer anymore. To Rini, this means that he more or less gave up on her, wanting her to pass on to make things easier. Elsewhere, the evil strikes again when Tony takes the end of the restroom. The door slams shut, trapping the boy on the other side. Papa manages to bust it down, seeing Ian getting dragged down into the well. He hops right in and scans the murky waters. He's under there for a concerning amount of time, but is able to rescue his son. They send down a rope and bucket, and he strains his way back up the walls. The white lady starts emerging from the water, her face covered in dark hair. And it actually appears to be Grandma again, not Mirwani. Seems like she's got a problem with Ian specifically for some reason. They notice outside there is quite a gathering of people all adorned in black. Who are they, Dad asks. It's obviously that satanic cult that Mirwani was a part of, coming to collect their trophy. Rini screeches, what do you want? And her dad takes her by the arm back inside. We now see they have the whole place surrounded, and wow, they're sure a lot of these guys. Grandma's wheelchair squeaks into the room and launches at Bari. Man, even after death, she really hates this dude. They run and end up getting separated from the younger boys, trapped in a locked hallway. A big wind whooshes in from outside and begins to suck Ian towards it, that same figure waiting for him in the shadows. Ian keeps hanging on, hopeful for his brother hiding nearby to lend a hand, but he is frozen, paralyzed in fear. Meanwhile, Papa begs for his wife's help. He cries that this is all his fault and begs her for forgiveness. It's his fault, eh? Wonder what that means. Well, stay tuned for part two, communion. Ian can't hold on for much longer, and Bondi finally springs into action. He yoinks his brother, and the door closes, launching the entity back. All the doors open up, and the family share a grateful group hug. Papa has had enough, and confronts the cult, spitting, you won't take my children if you dare come get a piece. They all stand with no reaction, and Tony brings his maddened father back inside. The cult all hold up their hands and kind of twinkle their fingers as though they're dropping something, and it appears they straight up teleport, Tony reporting that they are all gone now. Huh? The next morning, they get to work packing up the house, and Dad is hopeful that Allah will allow him to work hard and one day they can get the house back. Well, maybe not, Tony suggests. The plan is to drop all their stuff off tomorrow, and then they can celebrate Ian's birthday at midnight, to which everyone enthusiastically agrees. The family is closer than ever, singing songs together on the couch and waiting for that car to come and pick them up. You might think everything's gonna be okay. Uh, sorry, there's still about 15 minutes left in the movie, so no such Look, time ticks by, and there's a hopeful knock at the door. It's the Ustad who's heard that they're moving out and wishes them glad tidings. Rini decides to go for a walk and treks out to the eerily quiet forest nearby. She spots some seeds of some kind on the ground, staring at one curiously. I think the cult dropped those. The Ustad feels guilty about not helping them yesterday, saying that he is still in shock over his son. Bari is compassionate and wants him to think of his kids as his own. Rini returns and night falls with still no sign of the car. They decide to get some sleep for now, but plan and do wake up at midnight to still surprise the birthday boy. The Ustad wants to stick around too, complaining that it's lonely at home. The electricity suddenly cuts out, but it looks like the whole area is in a blackout, so nothing to worry about, right? They gather some lanterns and hit the hay for a nap. Rini is just about to fall asleep, but her eyes shoot open, remembering that article she found after Hinder died. It's tellingly titled, The Devil's Master Plan to Spread a Seed, the shot going all off kilter again, and this once more indicates a much larger larger conspiracy and plan at place than we could have ever suspected.
wanted. She wakes up Tony asking if he's seen Grandma, and it's only Ian that has seen her. There's more to the cult's rules, as they don't take the last child for sacrifice, as it is in fact an offspring of Satan. This leads her to consider that Grandma's spirit was actually trying to help them to warn them about Ian. Tony dismisses the whole thing as ridiculous. They've taken care of him since he was a baby. She also learned that the cult showing up is only to leave a sign for their shepherds, and they actually return later to take the child. And it's like the seeds are left to uh, let them track where they're supposed to go. Right on cue, Marwarney's pesky bell jingles accompanied by shuffling footsteps. They peek outside, seeing the white lady ascending the stairs. They open it once more, and she's closer now. In the other boy's room, Bondi wakes up to Ian strangely talking to himself. Hmm, didn't seem like he could talk before. He thanks someone for their loyalty, and Bondi is confused by what the heck he's doing. I'm just talking to my friend, son, he says, and begins to giggle evilly. He walks out still laughing in a sinister tone, and it looks like that article was uh, right after all. Ian is a child of Satan. Well, happy birthday. He looks over to the window, seeing two white sheeted figures there, and leaps under the bed. The front door swings open, and Mama's feet stop right in front of Bondi, the boy doing everything he can to stay silent. The Ustad awakes from his slumber, just in time to be overwhelmed by a gaggle of pokongs. Indonesian ghosts. He recognizes his son amongst them, and more shove their way inside. Papa is still in bed and finds the bell in his hand, and rolls over to his wife reaching out and groaning. He locks the door behind him like, ooh, nuts for that, dude. He tramples around the house to find his kids, and in the main room find the Ustad with his throat ripped out. Bondi shouts for his papa, and he retrieves him from under the bed. But what about Ian? Mom's bell starts ringing, and footsteps stomp down the stairs. Rini peeks out, hearing Ian still giggling. He's so happy now that he's Satan's son, what the heck? He strolls down, followed later by the white lady. They ask again about Ian, and we know that he must stay here. Morning begins to sing her dulcet tones, and they all shuffle out. Coming to quite a sight, Ian is there saying, I'm here, I'm here, Papa, flanked by the legion of ghouls and more of Satan's souls. The horde descends upon the house, and there is nowhere to go. It looks like all is lost, as pounding continues on the door, it beginning to burst right off the hinges. And we see that it's Grandma once more doing her best to hold the mongrels at bay. Really doing the uh, unsung hero's work here, I have to say. Budiman storms in with the best timing ever, getting them to hurry along and everyone piles into his van. He struggles to get it turned over as the crowd quickly approaches. I always wonder about this too. If I was in this situation, it's like, you already know that things are going to shit and you pull up and you're like, I'm going to save the day. Leave the car running. I never understand that. It's like, well, got to save my gas. Like, run in and get them. You're already ready. Put it in drive. Boom. No more ghouls. I don't know. It's just, it's not even a plot thing. It's just something that happens so frequently in horror movies. And I always think that if I was in that situation, like, you know, if zombies were real or something, you know, and I was like, oh, I'm going to go pick up my buddy or my wife or something. Then it's like, I'm going to leave the car running. <laughs> All that to say, I'm not turning it off. It roars to life. And once more, they have to ask about Ian. He's not your son. He has never been your son, Budari clarifies. Well, kind of a bummer there. And they escape the madness and flee into the night. Unfortunately, the evil did get what it was after. One year later, the family has settled into a new flat in the city. A nice seeming woman, Darmina, drops by to gift them some food to a grateful Rini. She returns to her place, moaning about those poor children. And they have to make sure they don't move out now. At first, we think Think they are just normal, compassionate neighbors, but it turns out the nefarious cult has followed them here. Her hubby telling her soon it will be time for another harvest. They just have to be patient. There's a map on the wall nearby that depicts Indonesia and the surrounding islands, and there are dots sprinkled all over the daggum thing, indicating that the cult is much, much larger than we could have ever understood until this very moment. And there's a jar of those same seeds that Rini found out in the forest, and now I'm extra sure that those are the things the cult people leave behind so that the ghouls can know where to go. Happy, the couple proceeds to dance, leaving us feeling quite unsettled for what is lingering next for the family. Well, that was pretty nuts. What's really interesting to me is how the story is presented and how things suddenly grow larger in scale until we realize just how big this whole satanic cult thing really is. Even with the family, the kids have no idea about any of the satanic cult stuff whatsoever in the beginning. In fact, they don't even believe in that kind of stuff. But now we know that this must have been their parents' influence. In that way, the audience is in the same boat as the kids, taking in the madness step by step as it grows deeper and more to 
disturbing. We are constantly in the dark in a lot of ways in the story, just like the kids. For example, there are a few mentions of Grandma not liking Bari and them struggling to have kids and everything. But now we get that she figured out that Merwarni had made a deal with the Dark Lord and Ian was a spawn of Satan. Even in death, she was trying to do everything that she could to prevent the cult from getting the boy. Again, she was really kind of the unsung hero here. And it's interesting because it's hard to even tell visually a lot of times. Mostly she's seen in total shadows and these moments are treated as scary sequences too. So you don't really get that she's helping until later when you get the whole devil boy thing. It's like with Rini. Oh, maybe grandma was actually helping. Not like the entity that resembles their mom, but the actual spirit of grandma. Even she and Budiman obviously have been researching this stuff for many years since they had so much background on the subject. There's lots of little breadcrumbs and details left there for the story to continue that we don't fully understand yet. We do know for sure that the family is still in the cult's crosshairs, even though they supposedly already got what they wanted in Ian. There is a lot more history of all this to explore, and even more shocking family secrets to reveal in the sequel, Satan Slaves Communion. So check back soon to see what happens next. Until then, why not check out my video covering another Joko Anwar movie, Empedagore. If you dug Satan Slaves, this one is even more violent and disturbing. Lovely.